Well, good afternoon. On behalf of the Corder family, I want to welcome you to a celebration of an incredible life, a wonderful life. And for those of you joining us online, for those of us in the room, you may be from Abbeville, uh, you may be from Golden Springs in Anniston, you may be from Eastern Hills in Montgomery, you, you may be from First Baptist Trustful, uh, you may be from the Sweet Fellowship at Central in, in Argo, or you may here be, be here because of the nice man at the three-year rabbit, and um, you're just connecting that that was Dewey Quarter. But uh, God has brought us together to remember a wonderful life and to express love to a great family. And I'm um, uh, in the loss of a dear friend, a uh, dad, a grandfather, uh, a husband, and a one that we could all go around the room today and tell funny, in my opinion, funny and uplifting stories because every time I encountered you, it was, it was fun. It was a blessing. Whether it was a phone call during the week that uh, empathized where this pastor was and very few people, you don't realize that, but very few people know what it's like to sit in the pastor's chair, but Dewey always did. And he was always so encouraging and uplifting and uh, just uh, will be greatly missed. We're here today because of a friend and Proverbs says, a friend loves at all time and a brother is born for adversity. Ecclesiastes says that if one man falls, so pity the man who doesn't have a friend to, to pick him up. And Dewey was that friend to, to many of us, that friend to you as a family member. And I like it where James says that uh, the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteous and was called God's friend. I used to ask you, I said, when are you going to retire? He said, I'm going to go as long as I can't go anymore. And he did, didn't he? I can't help but think on Christmas Day that God welcomed a friend home, that God welcomed a fellow faithful servant home it was so effective for the kingdom of God, and we have much to celebrate today in that. As we continue our time, you're going to hear from family, you're going to hear from coworkers, you're going to hear from friends, and I can't wait to take it all in and to celebrate and to remember a wonderful life. So let's ask, let's ask God's presence and recognize God's presence with us today. Father, we pause today to just say thank you Thank you that our lives have been intersected with Dewey Quarter. Thank you that he was such a blessing to us. Thank you that he was so uplifting in our personal lives and Father, an example of being called a friend of God. Father, thank you for this sweet family. Father, thank you for their, their love for you, their love for one another. And Father, we pray that the uh, cohesiveness found in Christ might grow stronger even through this process we call a funeral. Father, would you bless us with your presence, with your healing touch, with your grace that truly is sufficient. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Eight years ago tomorrow, I came on staff at Central Baptist Church because Dewey Quarter talked to me. We had lunch together, and the, the journey began. I'd retired in 2011, not realizing that the Lord had opened a wonderful, marvelous door. Of course, I knew Dewey for a long, long time before that, in our earlier days in ministry. So it's been a joy to work beside him. And recently in our worship at Central, we sang a hymn entitled Worthy of Worship, and every time we sang it, it was just really uplifting. And I remember Brother Dewey saying the last time, I enjoyed the music. And every time we sang Worthy of Worship, it gives them goosebumps. So I want us to stand now and make goosebumps. May we stand.
be seated. As we continue our service together in honor and in memory of Brother Dewey, I'd like to just read his family. He is survived by his beloved wife, Jackie, his three children, Chris Corder and his wife, Sophie, Corey Hallmark and her husband, Edward, Casey Corder and his wife, Ashley, his precious grandchildren, Abby Phillips and her husband Logan, Caleb Corder, Will Corder, Haley Hallmark, Millie Hallmark, Avery Corder, and Bo Corder. A house full at times, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. His sister, Linda Bickel, and her family, his brother, Joe Corder, and family, and his sister, Jan Christensen, and family. And Dewey is preceded in death by his parents, Joseph and Winifred Quarter. The family has asked that I share with you just a moment about what it was like to serve under Dewey as a minister. Um, I first met Dewey in New Orleans, Louisiana at Ralph and Kaku's restaurant. Uh, the man loves seafood, I can only say that, okay? Uh, he was there talking with my wife, Sherry, and I about possible ministry position at Eastern Hills Baptist in Montgomery. We were finishing up our degree work, and the Lord led us in that direction. So in 1983, we began serving with Dewey, Jackie, their family, at Eastern Hills Baptist Church. Later, when Dewey was called here, um, about a year after he called, came here, he called and said, Hey, Raj. Are you interested? And it's like, sure. Uh, so God led us to First Baptist Trustful to serve under Dewey. And my wife and I have talked several times, numerous times, about how God has blessed us through ministry with men that lead well. Dewey was one of those men that led well. I learned things about ministry from him that have blessed me to this day. Uh, you know, the book... Not everything you learned, you learn about everything that's valuable you learned in preschool. A lot of the things valuable about ministry I learned from Dewey Corder. Let me just share some of those with you. The first thing that kind of registered with me that Dewey was a kingdom focused individual. It wasn't about his church, it wasn't about his ministry, it wasn't about anything other than the kingdom of God. Uh, at, while at Eastern Hills, rather than growing a bigger and bigger church there, Dewey saw a vision of planting a church, and Taylor Road Baptist Church grew out of that vision. Num numbers of members went to be a part of that church. Offerings went to be a part of that church. It didn't bother Dewey the moment because it was a kingdom focus. It wasn't an individual church focus. It was a kingdom focus in that he would constantly tell his staff, it's not about you. It's about the health of this church. I will back you, I will support you, I will be in your corner, but if there is ever a time where there's a choice between the health of the church and an individual minister, the health of the church will be the choice to make. And Dewey placed himself 
right in that category. The health of the church always came first. A kingdom mindset. A kingdom mindset with missions. It was like every year. The uh, Annie Armstrong and Lottie Moon mission offerings were front and center. Mission giving by the church. If there was ever conversation on cutting the budget for the cooperative program, you could count on Dewey Corder standing up, raising both hands and saying, no way, Jose. The cooperative program will continue to be supported by the churches that Dewey served. Why? Because Dewey had a kingdom mindset. He had the big picture view of things. I learned a lot from that. I learned that I was not the center of attention, that the kingdom was. And it was important that I carry that with me through the ministries that followed in my life. I also learned that your family comes first. That was a good thing for a young minister to learn. It was a good thing to see a pastor that led that way, a man that worked hard, but dedicated to his family, believing that if you can't minister to your family, then you're gonna be a lousy minister to your church. So he spent time. Chris, I think the only time I ever saw Dewey put you below his own desires was when the staff played the RA basketball team. Do you remember that? These were a group of RAs now that were, I believe you were state champion RAs that year. Yep, yep. And the staff, the five staff, were going to play these guys in basketball. And we were holding our own. I mean, we were, we were out there challenging. That was in our much younger days. We were holding our own, but it was a close game. And we were huddled over by the bench. And Brother Dewey looked in our, our little huddle here. We had our, our minister of youth and recreation was about 6'6", six, 6'5", six, 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 six. Nobody could guard him. And all he said was, feed Sears. <laughs> okay. So his competition definitely came out. And you took second place in that particular experience. But we learned as ministers under Dewey to take your off days, to take your vacation to spend time with your family, to make, let them know that they are valuable and important because they're God's assignment to you. I also learned that team was the focus. Dewey was an excellent team builder. Never did I feel like, as I, as I ministered with him, never did I feel like it was about Dewey. Uh, it was about the team that worked together. He supported us, he encouraged us, and that old adage that, uh, I is not in team, uh, that was true for Dewey. Dewey never wanted center stage, he never wanted the limelight, he never wanted to be his name up in the marquee. It was about the team working together. And he was an excellent encourager. <laughs> I know this couldn't have been true because every time he would talk about a staff person that, he was, that served under him, they were the very best that there ever had been. They were the best minister of education. They were the best children's minister. They were the best youth minister, the best recreation. Whatever ministry it was, you were the best. And we felt that way. We felt like that we had something to live up to because Dewey believed that we were the best at what we did. He never micromanaged me or any staff person. It wasn't that Dewey would come into your office and say, hey, you need to be about this. You need to do it this way. You need to do it that way. No, no, it was always communicated. God's called you, you know what he's called you to do, let's get her done. And we would do it as a team. And then lastly, he was trustworthy. Now, Dewey was a man you could go down and sit in his office, you could take whatever was on your heart as a staff member, and you never had to fear. You never had to worry that it was gonna be held against you, you never had to worry that it was gonna be misunderstood. You could talk to the man and know that he was your brother and you had somebody that you could depend on. Uh, for me, as a young minister growing up, following him as an older minister here, I have found those things that I learned to be, you know, just to be very solid things for my own life and ministry. So family, I wanna thank you just for how Dewey has blessed us. Uh, he's blessed my family and now my family blessing other families. You know the rock thrown in that pond, those ripples just go on for generation after generation after generation. Second Timothy 4, 7, and 8. I think this could have been written about Dewey himself. 
I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord will give me on that day. Christmas Day, Brother Dewey got his crown of righteousness from the hands of our Lord. Praise the Lord. Jackie, Chris, Corey, Casey, I want to thank you for giving me the honor to come up here and speak today. Also, as I stand here right now, uh, I stand with all these people, okay? And all the people online and all the people that ever knew Dewey and his family. Uh, we thank you for sharing him with us, okay? Uh, it's been our honor and privilege. In fact, one of the greatest blessings of my life was uh, to get to know Dewey and uh, get to worship with him and serve with him, work with him, and play with him. It was all good. What a wonderful blessing. And I'm kind of thankful this morning, too, that I'm here in the presence of people that knew Dewey. That makes it a lot easier to talk about Dewey because I... I always think of a situation like this would always tell my Sunday school class. I always say in Sunday school that it's, um, uh, that you'll never know the truth of God's word until you live it, okay? And that's sort of like with Dewey too, since you people have experienced the similar situations that I have with Dewey, and you've lived with him and you know it, and you make it easy for me to say what I want to say. Um, now, uh, a lot of us have had the opportunity of knowing and serving, do, serving with Dewey. Uh, and he's truly, just like it's been said, he is uh, a dear brother to us all. Dewey lived what he believed. And so when we say that, uh, then when you look at Dewey's life, you can turn around and you can understand who Dewey was through the Word of God because that very Word came out in his life and who he was. Uh, everything he did probably in his life, we can go back and look and say that that was backed by Scripture. Now, I first knew Brother Dewey in the late 1980s. I was on the pastor search committee here at this church who was charged with the task of going out and trying to find a, a pastor to replace Brother Richard Francis. And that was a daunting task because Brother Francis had been here for about 20 years. Now, uh, quite honestly, not knowing what we were doing as a committee, we uh, studied a course. We took a study course on what it was like to, to be a part of a pastor search committee. Now, one of the things the course had us to do is that it listed 12 priorities or 12 qualities that it thought was good for a pastor. And it asked us to rank those qualities in importance. Now on the list was this word called enabler, enabler. Now I never had thought about that. I never really thought what an enabler was or what that was all about. But when I thought about it, I thought, wow, that really was a good thing because here was our church, especially back in the day, it was it was so much of committees and people. It was all volunteers. The Sunday school was all volunteers, and uh, the nursery was all volunteers. Everything was volunteers. And I thought, wow, that would really be great, you know. In fact, I thought it would be, you know, just just really cool, you know, <laughs> to have a guy that was an, an enabler. Uh, but little did I know then, little did I know then, that that would probably become uh, one of the most important things in my life because Dew was truly an, an enabler. He has enabled many people and especially my, myself to succeed in, uh, or to move on in my walk as a Christian. Dewey came to Trustful and the Lord continued to bless him. Uh, he blessed his ministry and the church grew in, in just phenomenal ways. Uh, 
And it, it was not only me, but he blessed everybody with the person he was and the ability to he, that he had. Now you could look back and do his past at all the records and you can see that his churches were always in the top of baptisms. His church was always in the tops of RAs and GAs and uh, just every category because he just had that knack of enabling people to succeed. Now, if I had to tell you what I thought Dewey was as a spiritual person, I would say this. I would say that uh, through all the mountaintop experiences and all of the places that he's been in his life and all the times I got to share those with him, up or down, high or low, um, and above all his preaching, probably, above all of his teaching, his work, his worship, his service, everything, uh, that I, I would have to say that Dewey was a man that was committed to God. He was totally surrendered to God. And like what, what Brother Roger said, it never seemed to be about him. It was always God, and it was always God getting the glory. Many times I heard Dewey say, in fact, the first time I ever heard him say this, it was after a business meeting. And during that night of a business meeting, Dewey had got beaten up really bad. I mean, it was a nasty thing. And so after the meeting, I met up with Dewey and I began to break on everybody and jump up and down and scream and tell him what a bunch of heathens we had in our congregation and all that sort of stuff. And Dewey said, now listen, Mike. He said, listen, God takes care of his servants. And over the years, I kind of began to realize what that meant. And he would say that a lot, that God takes care of his servants. I found one time in Romans 6, this, and this is what Dewey meant by that. It says, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. You see, God, see, Dewey was committed to God. And staying committed to God, like that verse said, was Dewey's avenue to becoming holy. Just like you and I, we all want to be like Jesus. And there the verse said that after being saved, we become servants of God. And as we serve God and stay committed to God, staying at that, then we too get to experience holiness on this earth. And Dewey knew that, and he lived out that service. And it says, afterwards, eternal life. Well, I'll tell you, Dewey was never in any way a happy-go-lucky guy as some people may think. Dewey was very serious, very serious. And as you know, he stayed the course all these years, and that was for a reason. That was because he was committed and he was serious about what he was doing. Another thing I always thought about Dewey is that um, he really never owned trouble like a lot of people own trouble. And I say that in this vein, is that uh, he faced a lot of great things and a lot of hard things. But at the end of the day, uh, he didn't hang on to that trouble. Uh, and so I'd always say of Dewey that he never owned trouble because he knew who owned him. And he was committed to that. Now, as a physical person, a guy like, that maybe not been a preacher, <laughs> um, I would always say that Dewey was a man's man. Okay, he was. I mean, he, he would stand tall in the face of opposition. He would stand tall when it came to witnessing for Jesus. But more than that, Dewey was, a, Dewey was an athlete. Dewey was a tremendous golfer. My goodness, he was good at golf. Uh, and Dewey was passionate about sports. Now, if you, don't think that, if you don't think that he was passionate about sports, all you had to be was one of the referees or one of the officials say on the court, gym court, calling a game that one of his children or one of his grandchildren were playing in. If you were one of those officials, you would know right quick that there was somebody watching you. And I might add, not silently, <laughs> okay? Uh, but he was, he, he was very passionate about sports. But I think of that, that Dewey was a great outdoors man. Uh, of all the things outdoors, I think Dewey liked to hunt more than all. Uh, but there was something about that that made Dewey a chicken. 
Dewey was a chicken when it came to outdoors because he was deathly afraid of snakes. I mean, he was afraid of big snakes and small snakes, brown snakes, green snakes, black snakes. It didn't matter, he was afraid of snakes. In fact, he was afraid of a stick if it looked like a snake, you know, I mean, he was just that afraid. But one day that we were hunting, and it was a warm fall day. We got up early that morning, we went out bow hunting, and then when we came in, ate breakfast, uh, then we decided we'd all take a nap. We looked at our watches and said, look, we're gonna get up at 2.30, and at 2.30, we're gonna go out and go hunting. Well, Dewey woke up about 11.45, and the devil took over him at that point. And he began running around, shouting and hollering and saying, it's 2.30, it's 2.30, time to get up. We all got to go hunting, let's go get... So he looked like a bunch of three stooges. We were all running around there, running into the walls and each other, trying to get ready. And about that time, he bust out laughing. He thought he was really funny. And you know, Dewey did think he was funny from time to time, but you know, in case he really wasn't all that funny, was he? And I don't think so. Anyway. So we go out hunting that day, and while we're gone hunting, one of our hunting buddies, Eddie Stovall, killed this humongous rattlesnake. I mean, if I'm telling the story, I mean, it was, you know, it was humongous, it was big. 65 million rattlers on it, I mean, it was big and bad. And so we got back to the house that night, and it was already dark, and Dewey was already in the house, and he was working on some supper. And we decided we'd take that snake, and we coiled him up on the front porch. And we, and we faced his head right toward the door because we knew what was going to happen. Every night after supper, we would get up and start cleaning up the kitchen, but Dewey, Jackie can probably vouch for this, uh, he would kind of just mm, disappear generally. You know what I mean? He, he is gone, and he would generally go out on the front porch, and he'd get on his phone, and He'd call back home and check on the church and everything like that, and so sure enough, it couldn't have worked any better. After we got through supper, he made an attempt at a little lick and a promise at dishes, and the next thing you know, he was gone. And so when he opened that door, it proved to us one thing, that Dewey was an angel. He really was, Dewey was an angel, because when he opened that door, he literally flew backwards in the air and he landed feet first in one of the kitchen chairs. Now he was trying to tell everybody that there was a snake out there, but he was up there going And so finally he could get out of, and we said, sure Dewey, and it's 2.30 in the afternoon, isn't it? No, no, I promise there's a snake out there. He said, Kurt, get your gun. Of course he was talking to the wrong guy because Kurt was about as afraid of snakes as Dewey was. But anyhow, the next morning we got up to go hunting again. I went over there to where Dewey was asleep, or supposed to be asleep, to get him up to go hunting. And I looked at him, and there he lay with his eyes that big around. I said, Dewey, you're going to go hunting this morning? He said, no, I didn't sleep a wink last night. So we didn't let it die with that. We bought a rubber snake that next week and put it in his bed. And it, it, it went, on, went on for a long time, you know. Um, But really, I think we could all agree on one thing about Dewey, all agree on one thing. And that's Dewey loved people. Dewey loved people. I'm telling you, what a heart that man had. Many times while we were just sitting around or maybe we were at lunch, we were talking, Dewey, Dewey would always say this. He would say, you know, of all the blessings I've had in life, one of the great blessings is all the people that I've met and loved over the years and said one of the greatest things God did, has done for me is given me these relationships with all these people in my ministry. Do we love people? And there's a great verse about God's love in the Bible. And I just kind of don't want to pass up saying this while we're here because do we love people so much? He loved everything about them, but he particularly loved the condition of their soul. But there's a verse, Luke 3, 22, uh, that really applies here. It's the verse where Jesus was being uh, baptized by John the Baptist. And when he's coming out of the water, Luke 3, 22 says, and the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. And the voice came from heaven which said, thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. 
Now, this verse has two really, really, really wonderful truths about why Jesus came. And the first truth is this, is that God loves people. Loving people was a big thing to God, and loving people was a big thing to Dewey as well. Now, it's interesting in that verse that the dove descended on Jesus, the voice came down, and God said, this is my son who brings me great joy. And this was at the beginning of, this was before actually Jesus' official start to his earthly ministry. This was before he turned the water to wine or, or, or he walked on water or he healed the sick or lame or blind. And God loves us that way, too. Because you see, in salvation, God provides for us through his love a way that we can be right and that we can be saved. And he loves us the same way that he loved Jesus. There's no strings attached. He loves us and we can be saved long before we come to church, <laughs> long before we read the Bible, long before we learn any verses or pay any tithe. God loves us, and at that moment that we're saved, we're his child. We're heirs with Jesus for eternity. 1 John 1, 12 says, But as many received him, unto them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. And God loves us that much. We are made heirs with Christ, of course, and it's not on any merit of our own, but it's simply because that God loves people. And knew it, Dewey knew that kind of love. Dewey shared that kind of love. Dewey lived out love just like that. You owe Dewey nothing, but he would always, always still love you. And there's nothing you could do, I don't think, that anybody could do to ever hurt Dewey uh, that he carried that with him. He still, he continued to love. And the second truth right quick in that verse is that Jesus, that what we learn from that is that Jesus came to show us how to live as God's son. He, sh he came to show us how to live as a, as a child of God. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now, with me in my humanity, um, sometimes it's hard for me to see Jesus. Sometimes it's hard for me to love people like I know God wants me to love people. But that wasn't the way it was with Dewey. I was blessed, and we, all of us that know Dewey have been blessed beyond measure because in him we have a, a, a friend, like the verse said, is closer than any brother. And in him we have a great mentor, we get to see how to love people and how to treat people. It seemed to never matter to Dewey how he was treated. Nothing anyone could say or do uh, would make him say, say a bad word or stop loving people. First Peter 2.20 is an interesting verse in, in that it says, now, there's no glory, uh, there's, no, there's no glory to being caught in a fault uh, and then being punished for it, and you endure that punishment patiently. He said, but when we suffer for doing good, when we suffer for doing good, then that is acceptable to God. And I know, I know that all the ways do is love people, uh, all the way that he was always kind and compassionate, all the ways that, the, that he had time for you, I know that he loved in a way that was acceptable to God. Now, Dewey died on Christmas Day. And Jackie and family, uh, this is my prayer for you at Christmas, is that uh, it won't be a sad day for you because Christmas is a wonderful time, okay? Uh, in fact, Dewey uh, was called home on a wonderful day. And one day, too, all of us who have 
taking Jesus for our Savior. It's going to be a great day when we're all called home, and what a wonderful day of reunion that will day be. What a wonderful day of rejoicing that will be. So don't let it get you down going on in the future. It's, it's just going to be a short time. We'll all be together again. Now, at Christmas, there's a wonderful old movie we all like to watch. Most of us see it every year. It's called It's a Wonderful Life, you know, with Jimmy Stewart. Uh, Jimmy plays the role of George Bailey. And George was a, a man of great dreams and uh, an adventurous, adventuresome spirit. But as you know in the show, time after time, life got in the way of him realizing his dreams. Time and time again, somebody needed help. Time and time again, something broke down. And so opportunity after opportunity for him to go on his adventure passed. Well, George got older, and as he got older, as you know in the movie, he lost a great sum of money. And he was thought that his life was over and that everything he had done had really come to nothing. Well, now here comes the climax of the show. An angel comes, and the angel takes George to a what would have been world without him a world where he never existed. And in that little trip, George got to see the real essence of his life. He got to see how he had helped so many people and how the world was different because of him. Well, I really wish that maybe today that I could go on that trip with an angel and Dewey and we could get, just get to fly around and see all the things and see all the people that he had influenced and really how different the world is today because of him. And I can only imagine what I would see. But I do know this, I know this, without a doubt, without a doubt, there would be one scene, at least one scene, where Dewey let a man named Mike Carter stand on his shoulders and reach high reach high into a life that I'd never known without him. And I love him, and I miss him. And every one of us in this room can say the same thing. Our world's been better off because of Brother Dewey, our friend and our pastor. Jackie, family, God bless you. I don't look behind the pulpit, Mom. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I know some of you never thought I'd be behind a pulpit, but uh, be. Uh, Mike, thanks so much uh, for that. Some of my fondest memories uh, with Dad were hunting with you guys, and uh, I could be here for hours talking about the other funny stories and stuff that kids don't need to hear. But uh, um, but uh, I kind of wanted to just talk about being um, not yet uh, the son of my of my dad. Uh, <clears throat> growing up as a preacher's kid, I didn't understand how lucky I was 
to have a father as a pastor. Selfishly, I wondered why my dad couldn't have been a doctor, a lawyer, a CEO of a company. I always seemed to not like the pressure of being a kid or a young man that felt he needed to be a reflection of my dad. Maybe even at a young age, I knew that was going to be impossible. You see, my dad was the man I needed to be like. What I did come to realize is that my dad had the most profession a man can have. That job that he accepted at the age of 21 was to lead people to Jesus and eternal salvation. <clears throat> as, most, as, as a young kid, like most kids, my heroes were people like Michael Jordan, Ken Griffey Jr., and many others that could play sports with. Um, what I came to realize is that my hero was and always will be my dad. He laid out the perfect roadmap for me and showed me what a man should be. Over the years, I heard him preach about the three things he tried to follow to be a godly man. Loving the Lord first and foremost, being a faithful and loving husband to your wife, and loving your children with an unconditional spirit of Jesus. <clears throat> There's not a man that I've met that truly accomplished this more than my father. He set an unattainable standard for being this type of man, and I can only hope to scratch the surface of that standard. My, my father impacted thousands of lives, but as his son, no one felt that impact more than me. Dad was a significant rock for me to lean on for everything. He truly saved me, comforted me, and guided me through so many of life's trials. When something went wrong or I felt the way of the world, I would call him and he always had the same answer. While my, or excuse me, when I, I would call him and he always had the answer. While my questions and concerns were different, his answers remained steadfast. He always told me to get on my knees and thank God for what he's done for me, but also thank God for what he's going to do for me. My only regret is that I did not lean on him earlier as a young man. No matter what we discussed, his love was unconditional. No matter how many bonehead decisions I made, his love was unconditional. A lot of bonehead decisions. Uh, no, man, no matter how disappointed he may have felt, his love was unconditional. That's the way he was to all of us. <clears throat> I'll miss many things about my father. I'll miss talking to him about sports. Um, I'll miss talking to him about hunting or if the fish are biting in the lake behind my house. I'll miss discussing it up the coming Alabama game. And yes, I com completely converted him into a bammer. I think it's one of my better accomplishments. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot something. Uh, I'll miss calling him after I left the deer field and give him a report on my hunt. I'll miss being excited. <clears throat> I'll miss being excited to send him a pic of the largemouth bass I just caught. I'll miss him asking me to FaceTime him so he can see Bo and then pointing the phone camera everywhere but his face <laughs> and, telling, and telling me he can't see us because he was severely technology challenged. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'll miss him calling me five times in 10 minutes and leaving me the same message on all five calls. <laughs> hey, call me. Every time, every time. I know you called me that. I know you called me that. I'm busy. Uh, <clears throat> I'd love for one of those calls right now. But, uh, I'll miss making him laugh so hard he would always start coughing uncontrollably. I'll miss imitating what I call his Dewey-isms for him and the family to laugh at, but I'm sorry those will continue. <laughs> These will remind us of him, and that's a wonderful thing. <clears throat> that's right, Bo. Uh, these memories will bring joy to us all, and that's what you provided for countless people you've impacted. And that's what today is about, joy. It's human nature to grieve today, but as believers, we rejoice in the fact that you are whole and experiencing a joy we can only imagine. You are alongside the Lord. You serve so faithfully. I know he couldn't be more prouder to have you there with him, as well as finish, as we all finish out this short time on earth, you will be dearly missed, but my heart is comforted, comforted with happiness, knowing at the other end, you'll be there waiting to embrace me. 
the other day I read a letter you wrote me as I was set to graduate high school. At the time of this letter, I was a rebellious, immature teen, and our relationship was rocky due to my faults. In the letter, he was explaining the life's challenges I was to come across as I was to leave home and go to college. In the letter, he said this, thanks for listening to my heart, Casey. I believe that you love me as your dad, and I guess I just want us to also, I want to also be your best friend. Dad, I'm proud to say that you are my best friend. And even more than that, I'm eternally proud to be your father. Thank you. That you are my father. Paul, Paul, where do I even start? I remember growing up helping you out in the yard. While there were so many other places I wanted to be at the time, I look back and regret not being fully present. You would sit on the tractor and I would load the leaves. I wouldn't really listen, but you would constantly speak. The things you'd say didn't reach my heart at the time. I was honestly just helping to make a few dimes. But little do you know how much those conversations have shaped me. And the man I'm becoming thanks you. Attitude determines altitude. You used to always remind me of that. I know you love me despite who I used to be. Your love for Jesus and this family was rare to see. I'm thankful to be your grandson, and I'm thankful to have had you as a role model. I miss walking across the creek to see you on the bank fishing. If I could go back, I would take a seat with you and hope to catch a few. But the most important thing about your life was your love for the Lord. When people were around you, they couldn't help but know Him more. I'm really going to miss getting your phone calls and voicemails. Your life will always be a wonderful story to tell. You didn't just live, you left a legacy. You're no longer here, but God will continue to get glory, all because you planted so many seeds. And this isn't a sad poem, it's a celebration. And I know that's not normal given the situation, but see, that's the beautiful thing about the promise found in our Lord and Savior. When I take my final breath on this earth, I know you'll be waiting for me at heaven's door. But until that day, I have to fill some big shoes, and it won't be easy becoming a man like you. God, thank you for my grandfather's life. Thank you for his 80 years of age. God, thank you for my grandfather's faith. Thank you for the years I spent seeing his face. And God, thank you for the hope found in you. I will see my grandfather again, and oh, what a day I look forward to. The family has requested a song that's normally done as a solo or choir with the choir. And, but we want to involve the congregation. It's listed as a congregational song. It is a contemporary song, and I will be asking a question uh, musically, and you're to answer it. You know what to sing because all the words that you will sing are in white. So all I'll ask to do as we join in together. I've asked also our accompanist, Kim Cannon, and his wife, Jean, to sing with you. So you'll hear more voices. If you don't know the song, just join in, enjoy it. Enjoy the worship. Let's stand, please. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. We do. do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. we do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. We do. It all made new. We, we do. do. It's all creation groaning. It, it is. It's a new creation coming. It, it is. It's the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst. It is good to remind ourselves of this. It is together. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? A 
double blessing and honor and glory. Is he worthy of this? He is. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hope forever those he loves? He does. Does the God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, he has made us the kingdom of praise to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? What an honor to be able to be with you and to be able to share <clears throat> some thoughts. And uh, y'all pray for voice strength, because when I start choking up to cry, I always start clearing my throat, and I want to annoy you that way. So if you will pray for just strength, for breath strength right now. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to First Baptist Trustful. And, uh, for allowing us to be here today and for hosting this uh, memorial of my dad. And uh, that's, that's huge. And we take it uh, not lightly, and we're very, very grateful for them uh, allowing us to be here. And then I want to thank Johnny for the music and Kim and his wife. And thank you, buddy, for your kind words about dad. Um, Roger, um, love you. And, uh, I was uh, a very self-oriented teenager and was really frustrated they beat us in that basketball game. And I didn't give enough credit to Roger for being an amazing human being. He was our children's minister and <clears throat> I didn't see children until I had my own. And so I didn't appreciate how amazing of a minister he is. Um, but I do as I grow wiser. And, and, uh, but I'm very grateful for your words. And then Mike, that was awesome. Um, I saw Micah a few nights ago. I said, I know the Holy Spirit will bring unity in the message and the different things that are shared. <clears throat> he really just shared most of what's on this paper, just in personal story uh, manner. And that's very touching, uh, obviously very impactful. I told him the other night, I said, thank you for y'all being my parents' dear friends. And uh, I, mean, I mean it again, thank you. Um, and uh, Casey, that was awesome. You did, you did good behind the pulpit, my friend. 
who in First Baptist Trustful would have thunk it? And uh, and uh, and that's awesome. That's God's redemptive grace. The fact that I'm here as well. And then uh, I just, and Caleb, that was great. You did a great job in that spoken word. So um, here's what I want to do. What I, my, my mindset was is I was going to uh, share a little bit more than I'm going to share, but so much of it's already been covered. And so the goal of right now, the goal of what's been going on, what I told you, what I was going to tell you my goals are is to glorify God. And that's been happening, hasn't it? It's been awesome. Um, so we're going to continue that just a bit, maybe with a little more uh, clarity around why did dad live these ways? Because I don't want to take it for granted that everybody really understands what's going on when we start talking about this relationship with Jesus. Uh, and so I won't take that for granted. I'll share briefly about that. And then I wanted to honor dad as a phenomenal father. And uh, that's been going on as a, because so, we're, catching, we're catching this together from different angles. We've got friends in the room. We've got siblings in the room. We've got a spouse. We've got children. We've got grandchildren and co-ministers that are friends. And so we've got all these different angles, all these different levels and areas of impact of another life. And it's just amazing. So I want to honor dad that way. And then last of all, I want to encourage and challenge each of you and myself to grow in an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ and to be engaged with one, not in a religious practice as you've gathered from the things that have been said this dad was not in a religious practice. He was in a relationship with God Almighty through his son, Jesus Christ. And it impacted his life. It changed his life. It had impacted all of us in this room and all of us watching that are watching today by live stream and can't be here today. But you chose to watch because of a difference made in your life by another life. So that's kind of the goal. That's what the aim is. And, uh, I apologize for this voice. It's, it drives me nuts while I'm doing it, but um, I'll keep going. So on Christmas night, when we got the call that Dad had passed away, uh, Casey and I got in the truck, and I got in his truck and started riding over to St. Vincent's to see Dad's body with the rest of my family. And Casey and I, I was just thinking and pondering, uh, and what really came to mind uh, was what dad was experiencing that moment because he would have been uh, a new arrival into the presence of Jesus, which is a pretty amazing thought. And I was thinking about all the oh's, oh, 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 that he was doing. And I was thinking about the ah, oh, oh, whoa and just the amazing experiences that he was experiencing at that moment. And the verse that came to mind was a verse out of Psalms. It's Psalms 116, 15, and it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And that verse can sound horrible if you just take it from the way that I just read it. But what I asked, and I asked Casey, I said, have you ever thought about that verse? what that verse is really talking about. And he said, no, I really haven't. And I said, what, what's happening right now is something very precious to our God and to our Savior because a soul, a spirit that he's redeemed is entered into his presence and become, and become aware in ways he could never be aware of his Redeemer. And he literally is knowing fully just as he's fully known. Those of you who saw the Facebook post that, that quote I put out, I just want y'all to know Sophie pinned that beautiful post and I changed the name Dewey to dad and then posted it if you saw it, but it was really well done. And in that post, she showed a picture to you of what was on dad's bedside calendar on the 25th of December. And that verse is a very cool verse because it talks about this very thing that, I'm, that I was describing to Casey on the ride over. It talks about, it's out of the love chapter, 
in, in 1 Corinthians that Paul penned, and it really is talking about, hey, right now we're looking at, as in a mirror dimly, okay? And we know in part, but one day, but then we will see fully uh, and we'll know fully just as we're fully known. And that's really what was being described. That's what I was experiencing and pondering what my dad really was experiencing, being totally healed, totally whole, to no longer limping, no longer facing physical, mortal challenges to his awareness and understanding of his Redeemer that he had been growing in. So, so it's pretty powerful. It's an amazing thought. It's an enviable place to be. So what a Christmas gift. And I really have told several people, I'm like my dad won in the Christmas present category because what he received was glory. That's amazing. All right? So it's uh, pretty neat. Um, so let me give you the implications, three implications, and I'll do this kind of quickly because I won't have to cover as much. So much of it has been covered already. But when you think of precious in the sight of the Lord as the death of one of his saints, it almost could seem like, um, it almost could seem that God's being pretty insensitive to you and I because we're on the receiving end of the void of the relational break that took place right now of not being able to be with dad right now. But what's really happening is something very different. Though you and I are experiencing pain and grief and the divisive nature of death by somebody that's no longer with us, the reality is it's a very precious thing. The first reason it can be precious to God is because, as Mike described to you, he's fully aware of what it cost to redeem my dad's soul from death. And what he did to save my dad, to save me, since I've received that gift. And many in here and watching is he, he sent his son to this earth to live as a man and to experience life on earth for 30 years before he even began his ministry. And then for three years he ministered. And then he experienced torture, incredible pain, incredible rejection, Death on a cross, one of the most humiliating things that he could experience. And he did all of that to bear my sin, my dad's sin, and your sin. The ways we fall short. The ways that we miss the mark. The ways that we choose to be God instead of allowing God to be who he is in our life. He died for that for us and for my father. And uh, so one of the reasons that death is precious is because God is fully aware, aware of what it cost, what the full value is of a soul of a man. And he feels it just like we do. So it's precious because the cost is real, the cost is huge, it cost his son his life, yet his resurrection, the power that raised Christ from the dead, that lived in my father's life, that lives in those of us who are father, followers of Christ's life, that power is the same power that allowed my father, once his body stopped, to be ushered straight into the presence of God, which is fantastic to think about. Now, um, so similar to the way that, in a very real sense, the death of a saint is precious to God because he's fully aware of the cost. The magnificent price paid to be able to offer salvation to dad and every one of us means that ultimately the life of a saint is so precious that it makes the death of a saint something precious. Does that make sense? He literally has turned death on its ear. So the second reason that the death of a saint is so precious is because death is no longer what it was before receiving the gift of salvation. Death is not a final thing. It's literally now a transition, an actual doorway and a pathway. And that is precious to God. So our God in his wisdom and power has turned it into the doorway that offers more abundant life for followers of Christ. So when the Bible talks about saints, that's any one of us that has received the gift of salvation and has entered into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the Lord, 
okay, and the Savior of the world. So John 3, 16 reads, it reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's amazing to consider. And that's what Jesus, God, is fully aware of. And that's how he's turned death on its ear. Literally everlasting life is what my father is experiencing right now. It began on the day of his salvation. Now it's more real than it's ever been. There are no mortal, there are no sin barriers, there are no physical body ailments that are in all in the way. There's no emotional or mental uh, lack of awareness that we all can experience as humans. It's all covered. It's all done. The blood of Christ redeemed and allowed for that. So the second reason it's precious in God's sight is death is no longer death. He defeated it. And he's offering that to all of us. And the last reason, the last reason that, uh, that the death of, the saint, of a saint is precious in the eyes of God or in the sight of God is that it leaves us with the final and very powerful, powerful uh, feeling, experience of the relational impact of death. So for the last week, my family and uh, we've looked at hundreds and hundreds of pictures. You've, you saw them, you see them out there, you saw them on the slideshow. We've been looking at so many memories of time with dad and we've been reflecting. We've been reflecting like uh, Roger and like Mike did and like Casey did and, and Buddy did about dad and the relationship and the impact of another human on our life. But we've also been reflecting on our own lives. That's what death does. It leads us to reflect on the relationships that we currently have that are, no long, that are not divided or separated. And it makes the husbands start considering their marriages and the wives considering their marriages. It leads dads and moms to consider how their parenting is going and the relational impact they have on their children. There's no doubt that all of us experiencing what we've experienced today have considered how am I in my relationship with my friends? How am I in my impact ministry, inspirational uh, uh, capabilities with the people that I interact with and am currently still being in relationship with? And then most importantly, what death needs to bring us to is the awareness and the honest assessment of where are we with God? Where are we with our creator? Because God, as Mike said so well, he's a very relational God. He literally, think about this, he chose to create you and I. Why? What for? Well, it can only be because he wanted more to love because that's what he does. It's part of his very nature. The Bible tells us that God is love. Now, <clears throat> so he wants to give that and allow you to experience that just like my father did for over 60 years and experience in a very real, tangible way a relationship with him and the way he did it is through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus in his own words says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the father except through me. And so the terms God gave is he offered his sacrifice of his son to engage relationally with you and I. For if we receive the gift of salvation, we begin the relationship with God. And I'm encouraging each of you, consider your walk with Christ because of the death of my dad. So mom said, and, and, and we all experienced this, but she made me think of it and ponder it and reflect on the fact that dad would ask people all the time, do you know Jesus? He would do it at restaurants and it annoyed me because I went to eat food not to engage in a conversation with a waitress I would never see again. But my dad didn't think like that. So he would ask the waitress when we had 16, 17 loud people in a restaurant trying to order food, hey, do you know Jesus? And the waitress and waiter were just trying to get our orders and get on with things. But dad was going to engage them in that question. Well, why was he doing that? 
Well, because that's number one. It's the most important thing that we could ask. And not in an intellectual way, not in a religious practice way that Jesus was so against. Because one of the deceits of our enemy is to get you and I engaged in religious activities to quote, earn salvation, which is impossible. We can never be good enough. But in a true receiving a gift, engaging in the beginning of a relationship with God Almighty through Jesus Christ, you can experience and I can experience relational connection with God Almighty. So the death of a saint is precious because these kind of things we get real focused on when somebody dies. Our mortality becomes very uh, tangible to us, doesn't it? And so I'm encouraging you to let that happen. Ask yourself, do I really not know in a headway, but do I know Jesus? Am I engaged in relationship with the Son of God? Is the power of the Holy Spirit, who is called our comforter and our seal and other amazing things, is he evident in my life? Now here's what I want, the last thing I want you to consider. If he's in your life, there's fruit to prove it. Just like if you or I plant an apple tree and that tree grows and bears fruit, what will the fruit be? Well, it would be apples. If we plant an orange tree and it grows and bears fruit, what will the fruit be? Well, it'll be oranges, won't it? Now, the fruit of the Spirit that becomes very evident in mind your life, very supernatural, very God-inspired, it's not uh, enhancements of the Spirit, its fruit would be love and joy and peace. Oh, those are amazing, aren't they, to consider? Because love, love is not a feeling. Love is a, a dying to ourself for the good of another, isn't it? Joy. I've told people for years, when my dad dies, I'm going to experience joy. I've literally used that as an example to try to describe what joy is. Because joy is different than fleeting happiness. It's literally an inside out flow. It's a fruit of the spirit. It's not something I have, it's something he gives. And it's not circumstantially driven. And I am literally living proof of what I said for years. It's no longer a theory. I'm experiencing joy right now, though my father is dead physically and not with me. Well, why is that? How is that? Well, that would be because of the peace of God which passes all understanding, fills my heart right now and allows me to know that circumstances don't matter. What matters is, is relationships. And we're all very, very aware of that. So let me in closing just, just ask you this. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him in a real way, authentically? Because God desires authentic, impactful, and lasting relationship with you just like he did with my father and with me. And then if you do know Jesus and you've received him as your savior and Lord and you're in that relationship, how are you doing with the earthly relationships that he's gifted you with? Are they authentic? Are you being authentically engaged with those he's given you, especially in the homes you live in and in the friendships that you're engaged with? Are they authentic? Are they impactful to both of you, whoever the relationship really is between, and to others because of your relationship? And then is it lasting? Because the rich ones are the ones that last, the ones that last but beyond the fake snake and the jokes and, the, and then the real struggles that come in the relationships because that's what God desires. I've never gotten close to God without him inspiring me to become close to people in a deep, real way. So, <clears throat> let me say this. In my golf bag, I can't leave, I want to move. In my golf bag, <clears throat> I have a bunch of golf balls, clubs, and a plastic snake that I use about every time I play golf. So I want you to know that uh, I'm so honored to be a chip off the old block as far as things like that go. Um, some of you have been the result of that plastic snake and, uh, and have hopped very high near a golf cart. And 
there's so many ways I'm honored to be able to be like my father. But the number one way and the number one responsibility that we want to carry through is we want to carry through helping others enter into authentic relationship with God. I want to lead us in prayer in closing. I want to do this before I do. If any of you wants to talk further about, but what? tell me, I want to talk more about this authentic relationship with Jesus thing. I'm concerned. What, am I just being religious? Am I quite trying to do the right things? If those things come into your mind, I would love to talk to you more. Sophie and my ministry is engaged with couples entering into these deep conversations. It's what we live to do and love to do. So I'm going to literally give you my phone number if you know somebody that ought to call me and engage in communication to begin a relationship. I would welcome that opportunity. And so my number is 205-837-0310. 205-837-0310. I would love to talk further with you about your relationship with God or your relationship with people especially the ones you're married to or that are your children. If I can help, I would be honored to do so. And it's what I live and breathe to do. And so I want to make you fully aware that we're willing to engage that way, just as my father would have done for you. Does that make sense? So as I'm going to lead us in prayer. And then if you look, I really will, because I don't want the opportunity to pass, I'm going to lead in prayer and offer a chance for anybody that's watching this or sitting here today and you really don't have a relationship with Jesus and you kind of go, I don't have, that's not my life in reality. I want to offer you the chance to, to, to give your life to him today, to basically what's called repent, turn from your sins and walk with Jesus because my father will be honored in that process. It's what he would do and did at many funerals, hundreds and hundreds of them. And then I'll close for the rest of us in just a prayer of gratitude for our wonderful Heavenly Father and for being blessed to have my earthly father and you, friend, sibling, parent, grandparent, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the chance to share. Thank you for these lives that are represented in there. And, and, I so don't take lightly the souls represented in this room. They're so valuable that an enemy from hell wants them and is doing everything he can to claim those souls. And Father, you love us so much. You made us for relationship with you. We were created for that. And within our hearts, Father, you placed eternity, literally part of your very nature that we have to come to you to have these needs met and these things really these questions answered. We seek you. We yearn for you in our spirits. I pray that everyone that's here today and everyone listening or watching, Father, I pray for them right now to really uh, surrender their hearts and lives to you. Those of us who are in a relationship with you, I pray that we would work, we, that we would work and, and trust and walk with you to enter into deeper, more richer relationships with the people that we're engaged with and you. And then, Father, if there's anyone that doesn't know you, right now I want to offer the opportunity. And if, you, if that's you, then you can, you can repeat after me, dear Lord, thank you for sending Jesus, your son, to come to this earth to live a full life, to die on a cross, pay for my sins, and be resurrected to overcome death grave in the hell forever and to offer eternal life to me. I want to repent of my sin confess it before you, God, and ask you to be my Savior and Lord. And from this day on, I want you to be boss. I want to walk with you and walk relationally with you. Make me the person you want me to be. And those, that prayer will save a soul with its intent, when total intent is there. And that my prayer is that, Father, if anyone prayed that today, that they'll reach out and that we can begin to walk with them and walk in deeper relationship with them. We love you. We thank you for Dewey Quarter. We thank you for Dad, and we thank you for the life he lived. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you so much for being here today.
and wounded sinner, lost and left to die. Oh, raise your head, for love is passing by. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus and live. Now your burdens are lifted and carried far away, and precious blood has washed away the stain. So sing to Jesus, sing. You're doing well as I come to share with you another uh, devotional thought for this week. But it's always been an anchor for me, this passage, to know how God uh, works in my life and how he works in your life. And you know it's very familiar. In Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 28, he says, And we know that God is at work in everything for good to those who love him, who are the called according to to his purpose there's something we know without a shadow of a doubt God's at work in our lives uh, he created each of us he, he sustained us to this moment and he works in our lives uh, what's exciting, one of the exciting things to know is God's vitally concerned about you as an individual and me as an individual and when you think of all the people that he's created when you think of all the people who live in the world one of the wonder, wonderful blessings for us is the children of God people who are related to him by faith in his son, Jesus Christ, we're in the family of God. And God is vitally concerned about us. And whatever's going on in our lives, he's concerned about it. The affirmation of that 28th verse, it says this, we know. He, Paul didn't say, I hope so, I think so. He said, we know. He's confident. He's, he's certain. And what is he certain of? He's certain that God is at work where? In everything for good. Now, he's not saying everything is good. 
There's some negative things that are happening in the world today. There are negative things that happen in your life and my life at times. But we know that God's at work in everything, whatever's going on in our lives, whether it's positive or negative, God is working in that situation for our good. And so when we have that assurance and we do go through difficult times, our faith sustains us to know, hey, I may not know why God is allowing this. I may not understand the full ramifications of what I'm going through. But I know this for certain. I know God is working in my life for my good in this situation. You know, the day I gave my life to Jesus, my life was placed in the hands of Jesus. And so it was with you. And in John's Gospel, chapter 10, I think it's verse 10, John says this in that great Gospel, Nobody can pluck you out of my hand. In other words, we're safe and secure in him. The day you gave your life to Jesus, there's not anything that's ever going to tear you away from the presence and the person of Jesus. And so Paul describes it like this, Who shall separate us? from the love of Christ. He says nothing. He says neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. Because of the power of the resurrection of Jesus because he lived and died on the cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb, three days later arose victoriously, conquering death. Jesus says this to us, because I live, you too shall live. Death does not defeat us, and death does not separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. Death is that transition moment when we move from this location to that new place called heaven. And so we're not separated from the presence of Jesus Christ. Even in the moment of that transition, the Bible says precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. So he, we, he's, he, he has us in his hands from the moment we give our hearts and lives to him. He sustains us to the moment we make the change from here to heaven. We're never, ever separated from him. Absent from this body, yes, but present with the Lord. So what does that do for me and you with that assurance? It makes me aware that I can live today to the fullest for Jesus. I can live with joy and meaning and purpose, and I can live with a, a certainty and confidence and faith to know that whatever might happen, I don't know what's going to happen, you don't know either, uh, but it's not going to tear me away from the love of Jesus Christ. But we can rest assured that God is for us. There's not anything ever going to come to ultimately defeat us. We can rest assured that no one can come accuse us. We can rest assured that God, if he loved us so much, and he did that he sent Jesus to die for us, he's going to take care of us. He's going to meet our every need. We don't have to worry about anything tearing us away from the love of Jesus Christ. And so today I want to ask you to have that confidence in your life. I pray you do. I pray that as you live your life today, that you can live it with certainty and assurance, knowing that God is for you, working in your life, whatever's going on in your life, he's at work in it. He's working it for your positive good, and he's going to meet your every need. So I ask you today to join me in resting assured that because of Jesus Christ, we, have, we can live as conquerors. He says, even more than, than conquerors and have that victory through Jesus. So I pray you have a great day today. Uh, anchor yourself in the word. Stay close to Jesus by praying and communing with him and uh, pray for each other during these very difficult days. Let me lead us in a closing prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day of life. Thank you for your word that is so certain and gives us such confidence and assurance 
that whatever's going on in our lives, you're at work in those situations. And there's not anything that will ever tear us away from your, from your magnificent love. Bless each individual who's uh, watched this and who's worshiping with us. Give them grace and strength in these days. Bless their families. And I pray you'll continue to bless this, your church. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.